Genre: Realistic Fiction. Excerpt from *The Talented Clementine* by Sarah Pennypacker. Pictures by Marla Frazzi. Clementine has a big problem. She has no talents, and tonight is the big talent palooza. Every third and fourth grader will be dancing, singing, or turning cartwheels, except Clementine. Even Margaret, her best friend, has an act. Now Clementine has to tell Mrs. Rice, the principal, and Margaret's teacher why she won't be performing. What can Clementine say? For once, she is completely out of ideas. Essential question: How can you use what you know to help others? Read about how Clementine finds her special talent. When I walked into the auditorium, I saw Margaret's teacher and Mrs. Rice sitting at the side of the stage on tall director's chairs. I tried to hide, but Margaret's teacher saw me. She looked down at her clipboard and frowned. Then she yelled so loud, all the kids in the auditorium stopped what they were doing to listen. Clementine, I don't seem to have you listed here. No matter, we'll fit you in. What's your act? I went over there and whispered in her ear that I didn't have one. I hoped the kids watching thought I was saying I couldn't choose one because I had too many talents. What do you mean you don't have one? Margaret's teacher yelled, even though I was right there. Okay, fine. Maybe she didn't yell it, but all the kids were listening so hard they heard anyway. Hey, Clementine! One of the fourth graders called out, "Your face looks like it's burning up. Maybe that could be your act." Stop and check, ask and answer questions. Why does Clementine whisper in the teacher's ear? Reread page three hundred and two to find the answer. About a million kids laughed, even though he was n o t not funny. But he was right. When I get embarrassed, my face gets red and hot. So I didn't yell anything back to him. I just stood there with my red hot face hanging down. Mrs. Rice called me over. Come sit beside me, Clementine. She said, "You can keep me company during the rehearsal." So I had to sit in between Mrs. Rice and Margaret's teacher. Right there at the side of the stage, where all the kids could see me and know that I had no talents. The first act was called "A Dozen Doozy Cartwheelers." Twelve kids lined up, six on each side of the stage. Wait! I yelled. I ran into the gym and dragged a tumbling mat back into the auditorium. I placed it on the floor in front of the stage. Then I got some of the dozen doozies to help me. Pretty soon, we had all the mats piled up. Margaret's teacher was glaring at me. She tapped her watch. "They're going over," I explained. "No matter how they start off aiming, some of them are going over," and they did. At least half a dozen of the doozies went flying off the stage, and right onto the mats. As soon as we got those kids back up and checked them for broken bones, I saw something else with my amazing corner eyes. Stop! I yelled. Then I ran over and grabbed a handful of crackers from one of the third graders just before they went into his mouth. "You're up next," I reminded him, "and you're whistling Yankee Doodle Dandy. No crackers." When I got back, Margaret's teacher gave me a look that said she was going to remember all this nonsense when I got to her grade. But Mrs. Rice gave me a thumbs up. "Thank you, Clementine," she said. "Those crackers could have been a problem." And you will not believe what happened next. Margaret's teacher apologized. "I'm sorry," she said. "I'm a little antsy tonight." I wanted to stick around to hear about why she was antsy, 
But just then I noticed that the super duper hula hoopers had been hula hooping for a while. I went over and asked them how long they were planning to go on. The girl on the right said, I once went for five hours and 13 minutes. The girl on the left made a face that said, that's nothing. Well, you need to have an ending tonight, I said. There are a lot of acts after yours. I borrowed the Jump Roper's CD player and explained about how they could hula hoop to the music and then S-T-O-P stop when it was over. And I didn't even get to sit down again for the rest of the afternoon because everybody needed my help for something. Finally, after everyone had a chance to practice their acts, I went over to Mrs. Rice. May I go into your office and use the phone? I need to call my parents and tell them not to come. I think it's a little late for that, Mrs. Rice showed me her watch and then called out, Take your places, people. Five minutes to showtime. Everybody ran to their places. I ran to the curtains and peeked out. Every seat in the audience was filled. Margaret's teacher clapped her hands for attention. Before we get started, she said, I just want to thank you all for being part of the show. Each and every one of you is helping to raise money for the big school trip next spring, except Clementine. Okay, fine. She didn't actually say except Clementine, but you could see everyone was thinking it. Just then the secretary came over and handed her a note. Oh, oh my goodness, she cried. She jumped up out of her seat faster than I thought a grown-up should. Oh my goodness gracious, it's now. My daughter's having her baby, my first grandchild. Go, said Mrs. Rice, it's all right. We can handle the show. Just go be with your daughter. Oh, thank you, Margaret's teacher said. And then she left so fast, she really did lose one of her bobby pins. It didn't look like lightning, though. It just looked like a bobby pin falling to the floor. Wow, I said to Mrs. Rice. So now you have to run the whole show by yourself. No, not by myself, Mrs. Rice said. I have an assistant, and that's you. Me? Oh, no, I can't. You can, and I'm certainly not doing this alone. I really can't. I don't pay attention, remember? You do pay attention, Clementine. Not always to the lesson in the classroom, but you notice more about what's going on than anyone I know. And that's exactly what I need tonight. I don't think this is a very good idea at all. Well, I do think it's a good idea. I'll prove it to you. Principal Rice called over one of the hula hoopers. Hillary, what's the second act after intermission? Hillary looked around. I don't have a program, she said. Do you want me to get you one? Mrs. Rice told her no thanks. Then she turned to me. Clementine, what's the second act after intermission? Caleb, from the fourth grade, is going to burp the Star Spangled Banner, I told her. Does he need any props? A two-liter bottle of root beer. How long will it take? Forty-one seconds. Forty-eight if he has to stop to drink extra soda at the Rocket's Red Glare part. I rest my case. Principal Rice said. She pointed a no-buts finger at the empty director's chair. When a principal orders you to do something, it is impossible to refuse. Some part of you always gives in. So I climbed into the chair. Open the curtains, Principal Rice said, and the worried scribbling feeling exploded all through my body. Stop and check. Ask and answer questions. How does Clementine feel about being the principal's assistant? Reread page 310 to find the answer. Well, you would think those kids had never had a rehearsal. First thing, 
all dozen doozies cartwheeled off the edge of the stage. Well, except for one girl, who forgot to move at all. Maria and Morris Boris Norris, from my class, went on next. And they cartwheeled right off the stage, too. Nobody had to go to the emergency room, though. And the audience thought the whole thing was supposed to happen that way. So it was okay. The next act was the O'Malley twins. Lily had convinced Willie not to do the thing with his lunch and to play a duet on the piano with her instead. But when Lily got up to the mic to announce the act, she got so nervous she threw up. I looked at Willie, sitting on the piano bench. Willie does everything Lily does, and sure enough, he was getting ready. Not on the piano, I yelled, just in time. Then I ran over and closed the curtains quick, so the whole audience wouldn't get started, too. When the janitor came running out to clean everything up, I had a good idea. Send Sidney out now, in front of the curtains, I told Mrs. Rice. Why? she asked. There's no microphone out there. That's okay. Sidney's really loud. And she's going to recite a poem, so there's no cartwheeling, just standing still. Besides, she's got really skinny feet, so she can fit out there if she stands sideways. So Sidney went on stage and stood sideways and yelled her poem. By the time she was done, the stage was all mopped clean. Next came the hula hoopers, and they completely forgot what I told them about stopping. The music ended, but they just kept on going. Finally, I had to close the curtains to pull them off the stage so the jump ropers could go on. The jump ropers must have figured that if the hula hoopers didn't have to stop at the end of the music, neither did they. So I had to close the curtains on them, too. Then came Margaret. She did fine at the walking on stage on time thing, which not everybody did. But just as she got to the microphone, Alan took a picture of her from the audience, which was a bad mistake. Whenever anyone takes a picture of Margaret that she isn't expecting, she freezes. She says it's the horror of not knowing if she looks perfect or not, which I don't understand, because Margaret always looks perfect. No matter, there she was, frozen on the stage with her mouth hanging open. For one tiny second, a little part of me thought, Good, no showing off for you tonight. But then my empathetic part took over. I ran over to where Margaret could see me and waved until I got her eyes to unfreeze. I pointed to my hair and pretended to brush it. Margaret nodded like a robot. She turned to the audience. First, always brush your hair, even if it's cut off like mine. She looked back at me. I pretended to do up some buttons. Then I pointed to my right. Always make sure you're buttoned up right, Margaret told the audience. Then I lifted my foot and crossed my fingers over my sneaker. Never wear green sneakers, Margaret said. Green sneakers are the worst. Then she shook herself, as if she'd been asleep. She went up closer to the mic. Wait a minute, she said. I was just kidding about that one. You can wear any color sneakers you want, and green is the most fashionable of all. She zoomed me a smile so huge, all her teeth bracelets sparkled like diamonds in the spotlight. I zoomed her one back, except with no teeth bracelets, because I don't have them yet. After that, Margaret was okay. I went back and climbed up onto the director's chair. And Principal Rice gave me a huge smile, too. She leaned over and said, I have the answer for you now, Clementine, about why you can't have a substitute. It's because there is no substitute for you. You are one of a kind. 
And that's when I realized I didn't have the worried feeling anymore. Instead, I had the proud feeling, like the sun was rising inside my chest. The proud sun rising feeling stayed with me all through the rest of the show. And no matter what went wrong, which was plenty, Mrs. Rice and I just fixed it. Stop and check. Visualize. Use the descriptions to visualize Clementine's actions at the end of the story. How does she feel? <laughs>